Peter's amazed and he's like, Jesus, that's awesome. Exactly what you said. I just basically just said what Peter said. Exactly what you said to that tree, that's what it became. And then Jesus' response, he uses that as a teaching moment. And by the way, when he makes this statement, it's not becoming true, it was already true. He's bringing you in on the principle so you can participate in that truth. He says, have faith in God. And uh, for many years, I looked at it, looked at it over again, just to make sure I was saying it correctly. But the best translation they'll tell you in the original language is the Bible in basic English and then also Young's Little translation where it actually, uh, Young's Little says, and Jesus answering saith to them, little King James in there, but not really, it's Young's Little, have faith of God. Have faith of God. And then Mark eleven twenty two 22 in the Bible in basic English is have God's faith. Have faith. God's faith. Have God's faith. It's a startling truth to me that God has faith. It's like, the, for me, it's like they should like put this in all caps and stuff. Like, not just red letters, like highlighted for Americans. That God has faith. And it comes after... Jesus speaks to a tree, and the words he speaks to it becomes. And he says, have God's faith. So he's connecting the speaking to things, and then becoming what you said they would become. He's connecting those things, and he's connecting it to the concept of having God's faith. And you'll watch, in little places, he interconnects this kind of thought of God having faith. Romans 4, we know. I'm in the wrong place. Look at Romans 4 now. Romans chapter 4. They switched my Bible app, and I don't like the switch, but they didn't ask me. Verse 16, therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Notice he, again, identifies us in that Old Testament timeline. As it is written... I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of him who believed God, who gives life to the dead. He's, God is speak, he's speaking about the nature of God. Who gives life to the dead and calls things which do not exist as though they did. God calls things that exist as, as, as though they did. God calls things which do not exist as though they did. God calls them. But Jesus called things that did not exist as though they did, and what he said came to pass. And then when Peter was amazed by that, Jesus goes, oh, have God's faith. So he's saying, you can participate in that same power that calls things be not as though they are. Where does he do that? Genesis, the first chapter. Let's go to Genesis now. In the beginning, I'm reading you, King James. It really, it's probably not the best translation of verse 1 because how many know God has no beginning and God has no end? The earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So notice that the earth was void 
and there was darkness there. There was no form to the earth. So how does God put form into the earth that he desired? I want to suggest too, in the book of 1 Samuel, it says that God is described as having a heart and a mind. I also want to suggest to you, because he's the beginning and the end, he has an idea of what he'd like to create. He knows what he wants the world to be. But even God, in when he's functioning in faith, there's not anything that takes place, at least here on the earth that we know, without him first speaking. Then God said, that, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. Notice, he said, and then he saw. He saw what he said. Exactly what he said came to pass. So Jesus says, have God's faith. The same power that calls things be not as though they are. The same power that calls the beginning to the end. And then notice what Jesus says. God is assured that everything he says Exactly how he said it will come to pass. Isaiah 55. In the Hebraic thought, 55 verse 9. My ways are not like your ways, right? And he goes into that thought. As high as the heavens are your, you know, he goes into that dialogue. And he says, so shall it be from the word that comes out of my mouth. If you look at the original just understanding of that. The, the Hebrew would understand, the Jew would understand when he's saying that, when I speak, it acts. It was all one fluid thing. It wasn't a speaking and then it might happen. It was when God spoke, the same language, the, 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 the understanding that I'm not a, a scholar, but it's understood to be that. When he spoke, it would come to pass. That's why he says, so shall it be the word that comes out of my mouth shall not return unto me void because I have an idea, I have a mind, I have a desire. And think about it too. Your life is like that. He called things be not as though they are from eternity past. He knew the end from the beginning. So it's very possible that you were in God's mind forever. Here's the great thing about God on your worst day. There's not anything in your life that surprises him. Like, oh, married that fool. I didn't know that was going to happen. What are we going to do now? You know? He's like, I got a plan. I got a plan. I got it taken care of. But they got to come to me on my terms. So Jesus answered and said to him, notice it's Jesus speaking. It's not Brother Copeland, not Brother Hagen. The greatest teacher that ever walked this earth taught it. Have God's faith. And notice this. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain. Notice in verse 23. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are not in those verses. You're the one who's got to say. He who says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, does not doubt in his heart, but believes, but trusts, but has faith, 
that those things he says will be done. Now, here is a world-governing principle. This principle governs the world. It doesn't matter if you believe it or not, but it is the absolute truth. He will have whatever he says. He will have, he will have. You will have whatever you say. 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 Good or bad. That's why it says death and life are not in the power of God's mouth. Death and life are in the power of your... I believe many people transition from this earth before they have to. Now, that's your choice between you and God. And God will receive you. If if you've made Jesus Lord of your life, he'll receive you. But you want to... I I want to encourage you to believe God to not leave the earth until you've done everything he asks you to do. Don't make your goal to leave the earth when you've, you know, you had your conversation with your, you know, your third child that you've had trouble with. That's great. That's good. But that's not the goal of leaving earth. The goal of earth is leaving the earth having done what he asked you to do. But believes those things will be dead. He says will be done. And he will have whatever he says. If you look, I think it was still up there because somebody asked me about it. I hadn't looked it up in a while. There is a very great tragedy. I think we're now uh, coming about three years on it. Young basketball player died, right? Kobe Bryant. And uh, he passed away in a, a horrific tragedy, uh, plane accident. And they, there was an interview on ESPN with uh, a young man. He was friends with him, Tracy McGrady. They were friends since they were in high school and they played ball together. And he's in the interview and he says, I can't, you know, he's crying. I can't believe this happened. He said, you know, when I I knew Kobe, I think they met when they were 17 or 18. He said, and Kobe said this, I want to be remembered forever. I want to be one of the greatest ever, and I want to die young. You will have whatever you say. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive, believe that you receive and you will have them. Believe that you will receive and you will have them. Now here's the good news, because it's always good news. This God kind of faith and everything in the kingdom of God, this new way of living, anything that God asks of you, he gives to you first as a gift. Excellence, which every believer should have, is simply properly stewarding what God has already given you. Jesus talks about this principle, right? He said, it's it's not me who does the work, it's the Father working through me. Paul, apostolic language. I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who died himself, who died for me and gave himself for me. So everything that God asks you to do and anything good that resides in you, God has first given to you as a gift. So therefore you become, as Paul said, a steward of the mysteries of God. And there's an untold riches inside this kingdom. Untold. But you're the one who determines if you'll ever access everything that God has for you. And so he gives us faith. He's like, without faith, it's impossible to please me. So here's what I'll do. I'll give you my faith. Say, kind God. Romans 12, for I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than you ought, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one. This is Romans also 11 in action. In him, through him, and to him are all things. God has dealt to each one the measure of faith. Ephesians 2, for by grace you've been saved. How? Through faith. Not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, excuse me, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So God gives us 
a measure of faith. There is mountain moving faith, according to Mark the 11th chapter. There is mountain moving faith on the inside of you. And there is faith to overcome every obstacle in front of you. Look at 1 John chapter 5. Not the gospel, John, 1 John. Therefore, whoever believes that Jesus Christ is born of God and everyone who loves him, who begot him, also loves him, who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love God, that when we love God, we keep his commandments. For this is the love of God. And we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Just as a side note, one of the signs of, that you're growing in maturity is that you don't com- consider the command of the Lord burdensome for your life. There's a delight there. Oh, okay, God asked me to do it, I'll do it. For whatever is born of God, how many are born of God tonight? For whatever is born of God, this is, I love this verse because it dispels this thing that maybe is not so, not taught, but, well, it is taught by some interesting people who will be in heaven with sometime, I think so. Uh, But sometimes it's thought in the back of people said, this, this is, this is, Certainly in line with the whole of scripture where, where God says, I'm not a respecter of persons. Sometimes there's this thought like, you know, there, there's these certain categories of people. We don't actually say it like that. But we got, you know, the, 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 the people who got lots of faith and then we got the people with little faith. By the way, we're not talking about the, the, the gift of special faith. I wish I had special faith all the time. It doesn't work like that. I can't put on the special faith hat. Special faith is I remember one time I was years ago, I was in Lakeland, Florida at this church uh, Hispanic Assembly of God Church and this young man, we were praying for people that Friday night. And I remember he, he said, he, I asked him, what, what, what's, what's going on with you? He said, oh, something about my bones. He had this terrible disease. And I remember that night as I laid hand on him, all his bones, all coming into alignment. So I remember as I laid him, special, oh, you're not a man, Jesus, be fat. You know, pick the person up by the way. That's special faith. Paul listed as a spiritual gift. It's not what we're talking about. This is like personal faith that, that is apportioned to you as the believer. But sometimes it's thought like, you know, you got these categories of people, who, whoever you, you know, you might respect, you know. They're over here. Sometimes I, 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 maybe as a kid, I processed it that way. There were the people with special faith in my Pentecostal church. And usually they were overweight women <laughs> who sat in the front row. And they were the only ones who went to prayer. You know, I laugh, but I'd still get those women to pray for me if I had an issue, you know. <laughs> I love the Baptists, but I don't need a Baptist prayer. Love the, the ba- you know, evangelicals, I don't need it. I need any one of them women who's never seen a diet in her life but knows how to pray. Yeah. But it was like these were the spiritual ones, you know. Just having a little humor with it, you know. Like on a, you know, modern day, they've gone on the keto diet, you know. <laughs> now they're on diets. <laughs> and Daniel fast, you know. <laughs> they learned a little about nutrition now. That's all I'm saying. I don't remember, seriously, I don't remember at any of my church gatherings going up. They used to do like once a month or something, these meals after service. I don't remember anything non-fat in there. It was like we were proud of getting fat, you know. Now it's a lot better. We know something, but ignorance is not, you know, it, there's no blessing in being stupid, you know. Some of you grew exactly like a, ain't no non-fat, you know, like butter on everything, donuts every Sunday, you know. I like it just as much as the other, but you're going to die quick eating that stuff, you know. But it was this thought that there's just this certain category of people. And here it is, though. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. 
And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So God, the moment you get born again, the faith of God comes on the inside of you to access the inheritance you've been given in God. But he holds you responsible as part of your discipleship to develop that measure of faith. I don't know if you realize this, but I have the body of a bodybuilder. Yeah, I want amen. Yeah, some of you are like, what is this guy talking about? <laughs> it's absolutely true. Every person in this room, you have the body of a bodybuilder. You do. Making a point here. It's the difference between a bodybuilder and I. They've developed, they take time to develop their body parts. So that mountain moving faith must be developed. Get saving faith to get born again. You come in. No one would dispute that it's not of our own works. But now that measure of faith, now he holds you responsible for developing it, for growing strong in faith. And God is incredibly practical. Like, you know, some people are like, what do I do now that I'm born again? Start applying the faith of God to every area of your life. Because you'll need the faith of God to really fulfill your purpose here on the earth. Everybody's purpose here in this room, it's so beyond anything that you could orchestrate. By getting a college degree, all that's, you know, I'm not opposed to college degrees or anything like that. I think I'm on my third now. And I've learned that uh, uh, doctor degree is not going not gonna to get me to the finish line in the high call. Might help add to something, but because it's in obedience to God. But it, your purpose is so far beyond anything that you could do on your own. You'll need the faith of God. And so, how is faith developed? I'm glad you asked, Pastor Tim. <laughs> Fundamentals of faith. Here's a key point in this concept of developing the God kind of faith on the inside of you. Is that most of a lot of our training, and even in the body of Christ, especially uh, this is one really just not so healthy thing in the, in the South. There is uh, a celebration and learned unbelief. Most of them have been taught how to unbelieve really well. And we've only taught to believe things that we can see with our natural eyes. So walking by faith often seems, that's weird, that's, you know, that's odd. No, no, no. When we were walking according to the dictates of this world, that's what's weird. It's weird not to pray in tongues all the time. It's weird not to hear the voice of God if you're walking with God. It's weird not to hear God speak to you. It's weird. That's weird. So you got to rearrange what's weird. That's normal. That's the new standard. And so that faith that we have is a key part of the renewal of the mind. Your approach to God in this life of faith often determines what you'll receive from God. One of, your, one of your greatest postures before the Lord is how your heart is positioned in relation to hearing the word of God. God is trying to constantly communicate understanding and thoughts towards you. And then he makes this statement in Luke 8, 18. Take heed... How you hear. And then in Romans 10, 17, he said, faith comes by hearing. So you can be in a room and hear 
something that you'll vitally need. But it's your posture towards what you're hearing that determines the fruitfulness that that word will do. So in a life of faith, fundamentals of faith 101 is a high honor for the word of God. I encourage you. I do it almost every day, especially my wife. Lord, we make a fresh commitment once again. We choose. We can't do it on our own strength. We actually don't want to do it on our own strength because that's really hard. Your word is first place in our life. What you speak, we will do. Let our lives bend to your word. We don't want to make the word of God bend to our lifestyle. So your word is the highest place. And then we endeavor with God's help to read scripture like food. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. There's some funny people out there. It's funny for me to be like, I forgot to eat. I never forget to eat. I've never forgotten to eat. I might have to, you know, get caught up doing stuff. But you got to look at the word of God like eating. Put that word in there. Hear that word. And then we're always listening to the word of God. Sometimes it's just a a minute clip, but we always read a scripture before we go to bed and the first thing we do when we get up in the morning. This past week, we listened to a little Bill Winston right before we went to bed. Come on, we get into the confession. It's the last thing we want. We want to put it before us. What did he tell the nation of Israel? Bind it on your doors. Read about it. Talk about it. So then faith, comes by hearing. And listen, and listen again. And I encourage you, if God is trying to, you're growing, or you're developing your faith in a certain area, don't change the subject when God has not. Sometimes there's so much, there's so much good stuff out there, right? Really good stuff. Not, you know, like, Honestly, if you're, if you're a Westerner, it, it is your choice if you want to stay deficient. I mean, all you got to do is go on YouTube. It won't cost you anything. You know, like five steps to be nice to your spouse. You know, you know three steps to faith. You know, you find it. Not all of it's good, but there's some really good stuff out there, free of charge. Then listen, and listen, and listen, and listen, and listen, and listen, and listen. And listen, and listen, and listen. Faith comes by hearing.